Since the end of the Second World War, Arab armies have consistently punched below their weight. They've lost virtually every major conflict, even when traditional factors suggested that they should have won. When they have won, their accomplishments have typically been very modest, despite massive advantages in numbers, technology, surprise, and firepower. The question is, why? One of the earliest explanations people came up with for poor Arab military performance was to blame the Russians. The idea here was that the Soviet way of war was simply inferior to Western methods. But there are several problems with this explanation. For one, most Arab armies didn't use Soviet doctrine, and plenty of other armies that did historically performed much better than the Arabs. Another long-standing idea is that the problem was the economic underdevelopment of Arab nations. There's no question that the poor rates of literacy and relative lack of familiarity with machinery in most Arab societies in the 20th century did hinder Arab armed forces. In particular, the consistent problems that Arab military personnel have had employing and maintaining their weapons, especially their more advanced weapons, has been a product of this underdevelopment. But you can still win without advanced weapons. There are plenty of examples of exceptionally poor and underdeveloped countries that still manage to perform much better in modern combat than have Arab militaries. Another aspect of Arab society that does explain part of the problems of Arab war making is the constant conflicts between the autocratic governments and their military leadership. At times, Arab kings and dictators have gotten too involved in military affairs while at other times, Arab generals have gotten too involved in politics. When you look at the historical performance of Arab militaries, as well as that of other heavily politicized armies, there's no question that politicization has had an impact, particularly in the strategic leadership and organization of their armed forces. But politicization and underdevelopment still don't explain the greatest problems that have plagued every Arab military since 1948 the poor performance of their tactical commanders. In every war, against every foe, in every type of military operation, and no matter how hard their generals tried to improve them, Arab NCOs and junior officers showed little to no ability to innovate, take initiative, act aggressively, react to the chaos of battle, or take advantage of fleeting opportunities. To explain this most vexing of Arab military problems, we have to look at how Arab culture orders its hierarchies and organizations. The dominant Arab culture and the Arab educational system that flows from it inculcates behaviors and ways of thinking that work for most Arab organizations in most circumstances, but aren't optimal for modern combat. This isn't a knock against Arab culture. Every society has its own way of organizing its hierarchies, and every society's hierarchies function differently. That doesn't mean that one culture is better than another. Post-war Arab culture developed in response to its geographic, demographic, and historical circumstances. But warfare is a competitive activity. And what matters is which side's hierarchies function better given the demands of warfare at any given time. Over the past century, the most effective way to make war has been with a very flexible, bottom-up command structure the problem that the Arabs have faced is that their culture emphasizes a rigid, top-down hierarchy, which is the worst way of organizing for modern war. Because the weaknesses of Arab militaries stem from their societies, it's been difficult for allies like the United States to change how they fight simply by giving them the same training we give to American soldiers and airmen. For more than 70 years, Arab armies have been crippled by this severe mismatch between the demands of modern war and the skills favored by their society. There are, of course, exceptions. Cultural outliers can make effective fighters. That's why non-state actors like Hezbollah and ISIS have fared relatively better than traditional Arab armies in recent wars. And they operate in an unorthodox cellular command structure that requires highly independent tactical commanders. A good example of what the U.S. can do is reflected 
and how we helped Iraq to defeat ISIS. The Americans helped the Iraqis identify soldiers and officers who were more able to function independently, trained them to emphasize those skills, and then made that force the tip of the spear, backed by heavy coalition support. This model worked well for creating Iraq's counterterrorism service and should be seen as a good model for moving forward in training Arab armies. It will be hard given the severe mismatch between Arab society and the demands of modern war making, but it's the only way we're going to do better than we have so far. To learn more about the problems of Arab military effectiveness, check out the link to my book, Armies of Sand, in the description below. Also, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Rethink Tank. And be sure to subscribe for more videos and research from AEI.